Welcome, adventurers, to a very special Tales of Tamriel. This is a special bonus episode as our very own Nate, a.k.a. Misa, was granted an exclusive interview at the London Morrowind Preview event a few weeks ago with Matt Firer, Rich Lambert, and Brian Wheeler for us over here at Tales of Tamriel and the Dungeon Crawler Network. The interviews are broken up into two parts. The first is a group interview held at the event before a live audience with Matt, Rich, and Brian. The second part is a one-on-one interview that Nate had with Brian Wheeler behind closed doors. It's a lot of fun. I cannot wait to share this with you, and I know Nate is as well. And we hope you enjoy this exclusive interview, and we can't wait to see you on the shores of Vardenfell. Um, hi everyone, thanks very much for, uh, for being here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you, uh, my name is Nate Langson, I'm a tech and gaming journalist, and so for a while I've seen at GameSpot and various things over the years, and I'm very, very excited to be here, in part because I did a check on how long I've been playing Elder Scrolls Online for. Uh, it's approaching 2,000 hours, which I'm reliably informed by Google this morning is nearly 80 days, um, <laughs> which uh, is terrifying. And also feels like there should be an achievement for that at some point. So that would be great, please. Um, so, you know, I've got a load of questions. We're going to rattle through these in half an hour or so, all being well. And I want to start really by something kind of broad. And just to find out from you guys, like, what the game at this point, three years into its life, almost into its fourth year, like, what does it mean to you? And particularly, obviously, what does it mean to you on the cusp of this expansion coming out? Matt, why don't you start us off? Well, you got to remember, for us, it's in like its eighth year. Yeah, or, <laughs> ten, or ninth year. Ten. Even. Wow. Ten, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've been working on this game for a very long time, so we're super happy with, uh, where the game is. So I think uh, what it means to me to come out with, with to talk about stuff like Morrowind is like we are really, really happy to be able to do something like that because, you know, this is a major new thing to the game, um, and it just kind of proves that, that, that all the stuff that we did to the game to make it better between 2014 and, and 2016 really has, has come to fruition. So I think that's, that's the, mm. you know, I look at it and I'm, I'm super proud of what the team has done to, uh, to turn it, you know, to turn the game into, into this really, really cool thing that's so successful on, you know, four different uh, platforms, you know, in many countries around the world. And then we can do this, this super, super awesome uh, chapter on top of it. Yeah. Rich, you, I'm assuming your I, sentiments I mean, I, are very I totally similar. echo that. You know, this has been a long... A long road for for us, you know. Been on the game for ten years, and just being able to see the game and see the way people have kind of their perception has changed. You know, it was kind of cool to hate on ESO, you know, when we first came out, and now it's like this is the game, this is the game. Holy cow, this is an amazing game, and yeah. that's really gratifying. Yeah, so, really proud of that. Now, obviously, we're going back tomorrow and for the first time. Um, there's always a risk of doing something like this that there's. The hardcore fans, that would be me, maybe some people here, uh, who are like, please don't screw this up, please, you know, this has got to be amazing. That's us too. Yeah, I, I can Trust imagine. Me. So, so like with, with, with the threat of that hanging over you, like how do you approach this? How do you go into it and think, this is not going dis- to disappoint even the most hardcore Morrowind long-time Elder Scrolls fan? Like how do you prepare for that? Yeah, there's so many ways to answer that, but the first way is thinking about it. That's what our whole game is. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing is Elder Scrolls, you know, 700 years before all the other games that you know and love. But, you know, yeah, I think we are very hard on ourselves also. Like, we're, we have to satisfy our own selves. We have people on staff that are super into the lore, played all the old games. I mean, Rich worked on Oblivion. So, you know, it's, it's you know, we've been, we've been on this IP for a long time. And I think if we're happy with it, then generally, uh, uh, generally we'll be okay, mm. and, you know, to make, to make all the people that are into the lore... Um, satisfied that we know what we're doing. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I'm just curious. I was sitting in the front here, so I didn't see the aforementioned show of hands. Can you just have a show of hands? Have you played Morrowind? It was pretty impressive. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah, I shouldn't be surprised. That is a lot of you. That's like 95 <laughs> percent of this of this room. So let's just say for like the five percent of people in here who didn't put their hands up, and guys, it's really cheap on Steam. Um, you know, what is it going to be like for them jumping into this for the first time? Do they, should they've got a few months? Should they be on Steam now? Should they be getting Morrowind, or can they jump in and be totally ready to go? Brian, what do you reckon? I, I'd say they can hop in and be ready to go with the Morrowind from Elder Scrolls Online because we took the same footprint, kind of like what you guys talked about. And the cities are very similar, so if you want, you can hop back and forth between the two while you're playing it. Like right, right off the bat, when you get into Sedanine, and then 
in, in Elder Scrolls Morrowind, that footprint is basically the same footprint. Those buildings are basically the same spot. <coughs> and then when you hop into Morrowind, the old TS3, you would see almost the same frame. There's some tree stumps that don't have things in them <laughs> in our version, but there's lots of callbacks to Morrowind. If you get that joke, see. you know Elder Scrolls. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. There, is, there is a tree stump in, in, Sa in Satany in the Starting City that is well known as having a, a very, very important and ring. lucrative yeah. ring in right. it. That uh, is in Elder Scrolls Three, and if you know that, that's awesome. And I mean, you yeah. don't have to be well versed in Elder Scrolls lore either mm -hmm. to play more to play our moral mm -hmm. You know, the team, especially the writers and the designers, went through uh, an incredible amount of lore and an incredible amount of work to make sure that the person that is coming in fresh, you know, understands why the tribunal is important. They understand why these locations in the world are important. So if you're a brand new player, you can just jump in and play. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of depth in there, in in the whole uh, Morrowind chapter. That if you don't didn't play Elder Scrolls Three, you'll still think it's cool. You just won't get the fact that it's referencing something yeah. that happened in a game that was 15 years ago. Yeah. Like like for example. Um, uh, spoiler alert! Uh, you get off a after you're done with the <laughs> tutorial. You get off a boat in Sedanine and walk across the bridge to to, uh, uh, to the building, which is the way that uh, Elder Scrolls Three starts, mm -hmm. exact same place. Um, and you walk into the building, and in Elder Scrolls Three, the guy asks you what's your name, uh, who are you, and that's where the character creation starts in Elder Scrolls Three. Um, in ours, uh, you're walking in with another NPC who has helped you uh, through the tutorial, and you walk in, and the same and the same a guy is sitting behind the desk who has this a different first name, but the same last name as the guy from Elder Scrolls Three. So he's obviously the ancestor of, of the same guy that's sitting there, um, and, he, and he starts asking you, "Okay, what's your name?" And he immediately gets interrupted by the other NPC, who's like, "No, no, he's not one of those guys. He's he he he, he, he he's with me, right?" So if you played Elder Scrolls Three, you'll think that is the funniest thing you've ever seen. But if you don't, it's still a cool moment with NPCs, and, and you get right into it. So that's kind of the example. Yeah, I, I love that guy, because you've sort of three different ways of creating your character back in the original. <laughs> yeah. You just either roll your yeah. own exactly, or you do that. My favorite was always the questionnaire. You know, you know, would you do this, or would you do uh, this? Would you do this? And there was always a fun way of doing it, which is, which is pretty cool. I mean, I'm curious, you know, kind of related to the last question. I mean, you, there's two ways of, of approaching this if you wanted. If you wanted to play the original Morrowind again, you could either say, okay, I'm going to prepare for the new expansion. I'm going to play Morrowind all the way through. I've got till June 6th. That's fine. Or is it June 7th? June 6th. Right? June 6th. Cool. Um, or play this first and then continue it law wise by jumping into Morrowind afterwards. I'm curious, mm -hmm. which would you do? Would you play Morrowind the original first and then play this, or play this and then go and play Morrowind? I'd play Morrowind first, then play Morrowind, Morrowind first. Morrowind. I, I went back before we started on this. I went back, cracked it open, started playing it again, and it was a little hard. Right, <laughs> it's hardcore. <laughs> it was. It was. It's very, very, very hardcore. Right. Yeah. It gives a sense then how many sort of how familiar the dev team is with with Morrowind. You know, obviously. A lot of you guys have been working on Elder Scrolls for, for years and years and years, long before Elder Scrolls Online. Like, how, how familiar is that team at large with, with that original game? They're all, almost all of them to a T, has jumped in, played it. Even the world builders jump in to kind of see what the spaces are and how they work. Uh, so I'd say we're pretty familiar with yeah. a lot of it. Uh, maybe not as much as some of the really crazy lore hounds out there, but mm. yeah, we're pretty, pretty fluent in Morrowind. Okay. I know you can ask me a question, right? To, to, to test that. <laughs> to test that. Uh, that's a little bit down on my list. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're going to come back to some of those really hard ones <laughs> okay. you know, that I didn't uh, run by you ahead of time. Uh, but let's just talk a little bit about the game at large here, because I think you know, it was touched upon a little bit in the presentation earlier. Um, I'm really curious kind of how well the game is doing. Um, you know, I would assume this, is one, this isn't one big last blowout before the game <laughs> goes away. This is the game stream yeah. doing pretty well. Um, Please tell us we're safe. That wasn't a question. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. The game. Please is, tell us we're safe. The, the game yeah. is doing very well. We are. Uh, we're really, really happy where we are now. Um, to put in perspective, uh, at E3 just nine months ago, we announced we had seven million uh, uh, people who were who have played the game, not including free trials, not including beta, uh, and now we're at eight and a half million. So just in nine months, we've added a million and a half people. Mm -hmm. So that kind of shows the you know the momentum uh, um, that we have now. So. We're doing great, and we 
we actually have said publicly that we want to do things like more wind. Um, we're going to try to shoot to do that annually from now on. So we have a roadmap that goes out for many years now. It has lots of cool stuff in it, and we fully plan on doing it. So, yeah, we're we're uh, we're full speed ahead right now. Great. And obviously, consoles, by the sounds of it, are doing are doing pretty well. You're launching simultaneously, all platforms, all on the same day. Um, I mean, how do you, from a technical perspective, like how do you do that? Like that's, I mean, a lot of games will, will do this, but a lot of games don't have as many varieties of game mode and you know pedantic people like me picking it apart. So like, how how on a technical level are you finding that? Uh, you know, really, that job was made possible by the fact that the PS4 and the Xbox One are super powerful. Almost, they're basically you know gaming PC specs. So we just have the game, and the game runs on all the different platforms, including Mac. Like we don't need a special version of the SO to run it. It is the game, and that that makes it much easier. Obviously, there's some graphical differences because on PC you can take advantage of, of, of more advanced hardware. But but in general, we don't think about platform when we're designing anything. We just do what is right for the game, and then it, it compiles across the three, and then it works. One using a controller, but. I actually use a controller on PC now because I liked it so much when we did console. Even for yeah. PvP? Uh, even for PvP. Wow. I mean, the, you saw the video yeah. that one oh, player yeah, was playing it. with yeah. a yeah. controller. She was actually She's playing really with a player playing that. that yeah. Could school any of us. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, 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 was really she was so good. She yeah. came, so when she was came in, no, no. no. When she <laughs> came in to play, um, she was dueling other players on mouse and keyboard and she was packing them up. Like, she was destroying them. She was so good. Yeah. Wow. So, amazing. Yep. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I think about about battlefields. Um, battlegrounds. Yes. Sorry, battlegrounds. Oh, look at you correcting. I'm just making sure. <laughs> I was allowed one mistake. <laughs> that was my one. I mistake. did play a lot of Battlefield One. <laughs> just saying. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just okay. Battlegrounds. Um, you know, when the game launched, you know, Cyrodiil PvP obviously felt that was kind of an end game for mm -hmm. a lot of people, certainly myself. Um, more recently, we've had dueling, you know, which is very, very, you know, it's almost, it's micro scale, you know, yep. two people, any way you want, very quickly. To me, Battleground sort of sits somewhere in the middle of that. Yep. You know, they're, they're kind of between the two. Um, and I, I suppose I just want to figure out whether, um, whether that's accurate. Like, is this going to feel like a, is it a smaller Cyrodiil? Is it a bigger duel? Like, well, how does it, it fit that? It's still three sided, which is a big part of yeah. ESO. Um, but the thing that we felt we really needed to add was a method of I sit down, I have maybe 20 minutes before my lunch break is over, I want to play real fast. Uh, Cyrodiil, you need at least, let's say, a half hour to an hour investment to get a good play session out of it. Mm -hmm. But for Battlegrounds, we, we really wanted you to just sit, be able to hop in, play. You don't have to worry about a queue depending upon your alliance. We wanted you to get in, get out, and have a quick progression, not only just for player versus player, but mm -hmm. making your character stronger as you go as well. I see. So yeah, when we, you mentioned as well in, in the presentation that you know the alliance kind of restrictions there are gone. Yep. You know, the moment in PvP, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, if one of the three alliances has a lot of people playing, uh, but another one doesn't, it may well be that you have to wait just because of your alliance, whereas the other guys can get in a lot quicker. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's gone, which is great. However, I noticed in that trailer that they still had the little icons of the bananas yeah. and the Smurfs. That's <laughs> which means you're playing a seven hot pack, so well, well done on picking the correct one. <laughs> well, in, in that, uh, that is still what Rich said was a uh, place to oh, okay. You will see the actual <laughs> proper coloring of the enemy teams on there. So in the colors, this you'll appreciate this, was kind of a a bit of a joke about how there's team orange, team purple, and team green in yeah. Cyrodiil. Well, that's the colors of the teams here as well. Okay, so we use three different colors than yep. alliance right. colors, right? And you know, this isn't this isn't alliances, but I'm presuming that you know I can still get four people from my from my guild or my friends. You can still have a preformed group, and I can have the yeah. yeah, and they can do that. Yep. And is that true even with the, all twelve people? You know, can all can I have twelve people that I want? No. Cool. So it's four people you know, and then eight people who you're gonna kick their asses yes okay excellent good um, we're gonna come back a little bit uh, if I know let's go to this one now because it's actually still on Battlegrounds I'm curious like what you would if you were comparing it maybe to another sort of game or another um, style of gameplay that maybe exists in another game like what's it closest to feeling like <laughs> I'd say somewhere in a slower version of Quake yeah, it's definitely Quake is definitely, Quake is definitely more themed around a first person shooter type right. feel. That's why we have team deathmatch. Pick up and play and get yeah. in there and go quickly rather than kind of this long term 
attrition. Yeah, and and in terms of like that speed in designing all the maps, we wanted it so that it's maybe five or ten seconds before your first contact with an enemy. Mm. So it's very fast, very rapid. Okay. And, and in terms of incentivizing people to play a lot of these, you know, in PvP, in Cyrodiil, for example, you know, there's, a, there's an entire separate currency in the game. You know, the more people you kill, the more keeps you capture, the more times you're made Emperor, which is to say for me, never. Um, I got close. You know, <laughs> you're, earning, you're earning alliance points. Right. And you can spend those alliance points on armor, on gear, on all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. and, and you can buy stuff and sell that, and that's great. So it really incentivizes you to play, you know, half your life in Cyrodiil. How does that compare to, to Battlegrounds? Like, is there a new currency system to earn? No, no it's currency. Same one. No new currency, alliance points. same one. Yeah. Still you win alliance points, points in Battlegrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the key difference is, in Cyrodiil, you get awarded alliance points as you as you kill other people or you do, um, you know, you, you see, uh, successfully siege something. But in Battlegrounds, you get awarded all the alliance points at the end. So you're not accruing them uh, through the middle of the match. So we, we don't want people to earn a lot of points and then quit in the middle. So mm. at the end is when all the points are calculated and tabulated and given out. So you get one giant dump of points at mm -hmm. the end. Yeah. Yep. yep. Wow, okay. Okay, good. Um, let's talk a little bit about sort of main quests because the main difference here, I think, between how people will enter ESO for the first time versus um, if they played before is you're skipping the Whirling Prison. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You're not going through that initial story progression, I'm assuming? Uh, you are not. There's a new tutorial. Yeah, yeah. Dog. yeah. yeah I mean, there, there's a new tutorial that starts you in a different place, starts you basically on a boat. Uh, and when you escape that, you go to Morrowind proper. And when you complete kind of the main story, or basically when you leave Morrowind, and you go back to the main island of Tamriel, or the mainland of Tamriel, that's when we unwrap you on to... Um, the, the Molod Ball story. I see. So we had to do a little bit of rejiggering there, but we got yeah, it to So work. you'll still go to the, you're yep. still going to be killed by Man Marco, you're still going to go to the Whaling Prison, but it's a, it's a different, it's a story version of that. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. you're all, yeah. you're going from, basically going from Bodenfell into the prison and back well, out to the We're not going to spoil that. <laughs> uh, you will short see, answer it's, is yes. It's but, really clever. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. The prophet's still there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All that stuff is still there. There are two separate storylines. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good. Uh, that's the answer I was hoping for. Um, <laughs> Check. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, a lot of people watching the live stream uh, when the announcement was made um, were, what's the word I want to use? Very, very excited to see Nario appear. Mm -hmm. That's one way of wording it. I have a much more obscene word that I used when I was watching with my fiance. Um, she got very jealous that I was so <laughs> interested in this character. Um, why Nari? I mean, obviously she's popular, but you know, why did why did you go back to her in particular for this for this 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 new story? I mean, it, for us it made sense. You know, she's kind of a favorite for us, but mm -hmm. uh, she's also Morag Tong, which is very very Morland, right? She uh, is from there like that's she's her Dunmer, thing right, right she's right, done where right. she is the perfect guide and so that's why we we you know it was a no-brainer and can you talk a little bit about sort of what we can expect from that um i don't want to say relationship but you know she's <laughs> she's obviously there for part of it but maybe not all of it i think you mentioned earlier on that you know there'll be a particular part of the storyline where she's a much more prominent character mm -hmm. but i mean is this you know is she a companion in that she's going to be walking beside us a lot or is she just going to sort of show up at certain points like could you maybe tell us a bit about so she'll guide you through the tutorial okay so for new players or anyone doing the tutorial she's kind of there explaining how to play the game um kind of like Lyris did in the in the, in the wheeling prison but also she's describing a little bit about uh, the crazy you know place that that is Vardenfell. but then yeah she goes off and does her morgue tongue thing and you run into her through a specific major quest that's in there which is um about the house politics I see. Okay, and I'm assuming that won't be a problem for the fact that she also shows up elsewhere in the game. It's she recognizes you if you've done. The, she does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She will recognize you yeah. if you've done yeah. stuff. With but her. if you haven't, she will. She will introduce herself and go from there. Excellent. Okay. Good. Um, Warden class. Mm -hmm. Big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of questions that I could pick from here. I guess the most important thing is how it's going to affect game balance. <clears throat> and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about. Sort of how the warden <coughs> fits in relative to the other four classes that we've got. It's kind of a. Uh, it fits not only just the player fantasy of having a ranger slash druid, but it's a different style in the sense that it's more of a support style. Like it's got a lot of healing, it's got a lot of um, 
armoring and, and such from winter. Yeah. yeah, so and it has obviously damage from the animal line, but it's it's much more group synergistic than I think anything we've done before. Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think one of the things that we've already had to do a lot of because a class is really like Matt said, a class is really just three skill lines. There's a ton of other skill lines that you can kind of mix and match already, and so we already have to have that mindset when we're balancing. Mm. So yes, we're adding three new skill lines with this, and we have to be wary of that, but it's not a, a giant leap ahead in, in balance problems. <coughs> if I remember correctly, the Warden did exist as a class <laughs> in the very <laughs> early days. Of one, of the one, of our, one of our alpha builds, yeah. yeah. Was it an alpha? Okay. Yeah. And it was obviously deemed, it's not coming out. I yeah. can't remember the reason at the time. I think it was, it was just too a, different. It was just a name. Yep. We actually had no class oh, okay. around it at all. Like we had a, we, when we originally designed the game, we I think we had eight class prototypes mm -hmm. that we put together to kind of see what would be the best mix. Um, and then, cool. and <laughs> yeah, wow, okay. And then, and then we picked the four that we thought would be the best uh, for the launch version of the game, and those are the four that we have. But yes, the very first alpha build that we put out, which I think the, beta, the first beta build might have had it too, players data mined, mm -hmm. and we kept uh, the name Warden in there, and they data mined that, and that's right. But there was actually no class that was Warden, it was just the name. I see, okay. Because my, my follow-up question to that was going to be, so you're bringing the Warden class back, yeah. that's exciting, <laughs> why now? And I suppose I can still ask that question in a way, because you know you technically could have brought the Warden out with, I mean, possibly not with Homestead, but with any of the other de recent DLC, maybe, you know, theoretically. So is there some... Is there some reason why the Warden's coming with this expansion other than it just felt like the right time? I think the, the biggest reason for that is that when you, when you get Morrowind, you unlock a whole suite of things, including the class. So if it was just, let's say, DLC and included with ESO+, Plus, what happens if you shut your ESO Plus off? Do you still have that class? Do you still have that character? Mm -hmm. So that's why it made the most sense to go into the chapter, because you get all these things all together and you unlock the warden class forever. I see, okay. Plus it's and, and it not was the as, right time. Yeah, yeah, that too, but it's also not that easy to make a new class. Like no. it's, it takes a long time from, you know, art, to, you know, with the animations and the effects and then the balance side and mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's a big deal. It's not, you know, really easy to just whip one out and, and away you go. And, and, you know, I think from what I've understood so far is that the Warden class isn't restricted to Vardenfell. No. So, it, you know, it's not a case of rolling a new character as a Warden, playing through the storyline, and then, you know, rolling again. Like, you'll take the Warden out, or you can create the Warden, ignore Vardenfell entirely, and just mm -hmm. buy the, you know... Yep. The, the, yep. And the go chapter, play wherever you and want. And go and do what you want. Yep. So with that in mind, assuming that the Warden's going to be a pretty popular thing for people to do, is there a risk that we're going to have Cyrodiil just full of Wardens for, like, three months? <laughs> sure. Like, I mean, that's, we, we that's have that with any class sure. currently, yeah. Yeah. And anytime we change balance, that's kind of what you see. For like uh -huh. the first couple of weeks, everybody plays that class. Yeah. And then they go back to the class that they want to play. So. Mm. And can I take my bear into Cyrodiil? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have a lot of bears. He is your ultimate. Yeah. He is the ultimate. You have to have a double bard if you want it on both mm. up all the time. But yeah, you'll, you'll see bears out there. Did you have to make any adjustments? This wasn't actually on my original list, but did you have to make any... Uh, sort of technical adjustments to how Cyrodiil, like from a load balance, uh, load managing perspective, underneath the game, in order to support that many new objects. Because I vaguely remember that there used to be like deer in Cyrodiil, and then <laughs> the, the deer were all slaughtered right. because it was having a negative effect on the game's performance. And now we're bringing bears in. Is that they're more be... powerful, so they can be allowed? Uh, um, <laughs> no, th we've been continually making adjustments to Cyrodiil performance. Yeah. over the past two years. It's got a lot better. Yeah, a lot it better. has gotten a lot better, especially this last patch. And we are getting closer and closer to where we want to be with it as a whole, like where we, where we can go, all right, it's good. Mm -hmm. So we've been progressing towards that more and more and more. And we believe that when the bear pops out there, it's going to be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine. I mean, there are sorcerers there that have... That's they have classes yeah, too. Yeah, so, yeah, so. It's not like it's something. That's it doesn't. It's not as consumptive as having a wandering right. deer. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly from the you know the kind of quality of life service that's been sort of given to the game over the last couple of years, as a regular PvP player myself, that you can tell that improvement is, has been a lot. You know, the general benchmark is Alessia bridge fights. Oh, yes, hundred people. <laughs> if it's over ten frames a second, then that's good. And right now, it, it is. Smooth. Like, yeah. We still have work to do, though. Yes. 
yeah on that um, tell us a bit more about how the, the sort of the new content affects the base game how it affects it yeah like what is, is the I mean we've got the warden class but are there any other elements <laughs> that have sort of blended into the into the main game in some way um, most of it is update 14 uh, stuff. okay yeah like all the extra stuff that we're doing outside of that oh okay uh, most of that we haven't really talked about. You, know? mm. you got to see a little bit of it in that in that PvP video where there were the buff trackers mm. um, on the console UI. Uh, that's something that we're working on to put in so that it's a little bit easier for you to see which buffs and debuffs you have on. Yeah. Um, which has been a pretty regular addition to the game. You know, we've had uh, you know like the battle text, for example, which yeah. is yeah, the incredibly text. useful, mm -hmm. um, and particularly in learning how your attacks, your critical hits, yeah. and things are affecting other players. It's much more unless you're using mods. Then that was a you know a great addition. Right, the console right. players were extremely happy with. Yeah, I time. imagine they yeah, were. We, we always try to have at least a couple quality of life type things put in. Mm. Um, we're really looking at balance hard for fourteen as well. Okay. So uh, expect some more changes there. Mm. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to talking a little bit more about uh, sort of ESO plus, I guess, and and sort of. You know, there's one over. Well, there are two overarching questions that you've been asked. One of them you sort of addressed before, which is why is this called a chapter, not a DLC? Mm -hmm. um, but I think really the reason that is such a common question is that at the moment, for an ESO Plus subscriber, there's kind of been this cadence of every three months says a, there's sort of a DLC sort of content. Either it's something like Thieves Guild, Dark Brotherhood, or uh, Shadows of the Hist, more dungeon based stuff. At the moment, what it feels like is that for one of those three cycles, we have sort of a big paid chapter, which if you don't buy that, you might sort of go six months and feel you've not had anything extra for your ESO plus. Like how, like what's the response that you guys have to that? And is there any sort of change or tweak that we can talk yeah, about? Yeah, the, the, the way we see it is basically it's four times a year we have an update mm -hmm. and we've been doing that ever since the game launched. So uh, in fifth, in 25th, 2015, we had two, two DLCs, but four updates. In 2016, we had four updates and three DLCs, and then here in in um, this year, and I've gotten to this point in the press event, and I have not yet talked about Homestead, which <laughs> I, I am sorry, uh, everyone. But uh, so we had an update that just launched uh, a couple weeks ago, which is housing in, in ESO, um, which is Homestead, and that is kind of a a, uh, a free um, a update that goes to all of the players of the game. Um, so Homestead and One Tamriel are good examples of not paid DLC, but uh, big um, advances that came to the game that, that everyone can enjoy. Um, I think that is one example of, of what you're talking about. But we are planning for uh, two DLCs this year after uh, Morrowind launches. So okay. we're still, we're still going to be in that two to three per, per year, in, in, um, not including the, the, the chapter. So there'll be plenty of value for ESO Plus guys. Okay. And also, we're all, we're always looking at making ESO Plus better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we added the crafting, we added the expanded inventory crafting bag stuff last year for housing. Uh, if you're a Plus member, you get to put twice as much stuff in your house as if you're not a Plus member, and so forth. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing stuff like that to make sure that the value is proposition is high. And there's going to be new houses as part of this patch, right? We're going to be able to live in Vodafone? Yep. Yes. Believe. We haven't talked a lot about that publicly, but yep. uh, there, will, there will be houses for player housing and more when for you to buy. Any chance I can buy a Dwemer a Dwarven Sphere as a mount? As a mount? <laughs> we, no. How about we are not going to speculate no on comment. future, uh, future <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. Dwarven Sphere is confirmed. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did not, not say that. <laughs> no, fine. Um, I'm curious. One thing that wasn't touched upon a, a, sort of a great deal, but I think it's worth uh, talking about now, is the Halls of Fabrication. Uh -huh. Is the name of the new trial? trial? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which I think a lot of people will be excited about. It's been a while since we've had a new trial. I think the last was in Thieves Guild. Yep. With more right. of Lorcash. Yeah. More of Lorcash. So can you sort of give us a sense of what we can expect in this trial? And, and also... <laughs> Pain. <laughs> yeah. Pain. <laughs> um, yeah, so the without too many spoilers... The story behind the trial is uh, you actually meet up with Divith, Divith Fear, and I don't know if people you know clue into that name, but you actually meet him in Morrowind. So uh, he's a super super powerful mage in Morrowind, and so you meet him kind of early on in his life here, and he's discovered an entrance to one of Sothisil's clockwork workshops, mm. uh, and of course, being accidentally found, he's accidentally set off the defenses, and so you're kind of working your way through the defenses with him. Okay. 
Where does it lie on the difficulty scale? Is this going to be, you know, one of those people that, that say it's, it's the hardest one ever, kind of like more Lorcage was? Yeah, like we have normal and veteran modes in there. So okay. in normal mode, you know, we're tuning it so that the more average player can kind of get through. But the, the veteran mode is, yeah, we want it to be pain. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but the rewards will be great. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk about rewards? I don't think those are finalized yet. Yeah, we haven't no. really finalized yeah. them. Okay, we'll, we'll come back it's to that. It's the stuff you get from there'll the be, other there'll trials. Be new stuff stuff to get. There'll, be, there'll be new item sets. Yeah. There'll be new cosmetic type things. Mm-hmm. Like it, For the trial in particular, if you think along the line of the rewards for Lorcage, where there was like a skin and a title and things like that, we want to do the same kind of thing. Okay, okay. Um, just because I'm conscious of time, I'm curious, will we have many questions from the audience? Just a rough show of hands, I don't have any questions yet. Okay, there's a few, a couple of hands. Okay, we'll come, we'll come to that. We'll come to that shortly. Um, let me see. What have we got here? That we haven't touched on here. So we're seven, we're seven hundred years closer to the disappearance of the Dwemer. <laughs> uh, now, obviously, we don't find out how they vanished because otherwise we'd know it in the later games already. But are we? Is there any chance we're touching upon what the hell happened with those guys? We are 700 years closer, but still a long way from when it happened. So, <laughs> right. Okay. Some things are best left on. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Um, the answer we wanted. The mystery continues. Okay. We've got some good theories though on the web, and uh, over the last few years, I think in particular about what happened with them. Uh, let's see. What else have we got here? Oh, this is an interesting one. So I plugged this actually off Reddit. Um, people were curious about whether they'll be able to re-roll as a warden, like as table like class. They have. Yeah, as a, as a no, change. you have to start a new class. You have to you start. Won't, you will be able to change your class into that one. Okay, make your brand new character. That's yep. a re-roll. <laughs> and um, any discussion of raising champion points? I mean, probably will. But what about CP caps for gear? And as in gear, there won't be a CP cap increase on gear. No CP cap increase. Nope. Okay. Um, Fine. Do we have any questions before we move on a little bit? We've got a couple. Let me this chap here in the orange. Yeah. Uh, any advice to uh, the new players coming in to uh, to Morrowind for the very first time, unfamiliar with the law? Um, we d- we actually did a um, a major effort to introduce the the Vardenfell lore to players, like starting in the tutorial, because we know it's different. I mean, even for Tamriel lore, it's different. So. Um, we had, there are a lot of books lying around right in the beginning. There are a lot of NPCs to talk to that talk about the different houses and politics and, and so forth. So, yes, we, we did take that um, uh, into account when we designed, especially the tutorial. Um, another thing we did that we, that we tried to uh, made a conscious effort, um, we set the tutorial in Morrowind. So you can see the, the mountain, you can, like, it's all part of the same world. So it's not... You know, you're one place and then you're another place, so you're starting to be introduced to everything right from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, my advice is take your time. Walk yeah. through mm-hmm. it, explore every nook and cranny, read, read every everything. book. Like, that is where Elder Scrolls comes alive, is feeling how the world uh, interacts with everything else. So take your time. And, and should we should we prepare for battle battlegrounds in uh, in a similar way? Should we maybe have a play in Cyrodiil first? Should we get used to dueling? <laughs> I'd actually flip that. I, when you hit level ten, that's when you unlock going into Cyrodiil or battlegrounds. I would say going into battlegrounds first may be easier because it's it's ready set go. Where in Cyrodiil we had to create a whole tutorial to teach you the entire system. Whereas battlegrounds, they're they're schoolyard games. It's capture the flag. You know, run around and hold a point. Like that's stuff that's very simple, very easy. You're definitely going to find people easier. Yes, you will. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You get matched up right away. Yeah. So that's good. I mean, it's a stepping stone into Cyrodiil, maybe. Yeah. Yes. People buying this for the first time, or who always yeah. been terrified of the idea of you know battling a hundred people out in the open yeah. open world. This is almost a primer. I mean, to that too, we are also going to have a queue that's ten to forty nine, much like Blackwater Blade. Mm. So you can have a, a queue that you can go into where you're not going to go against Rich. <laughs> so, well, you're Mr. CP 600, no, level 50. I'm higher than Run around yes. trying to get on the Ember. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I had another question. Yeah. There's a couple hands up there. Who is there? Well, let's oh, let's do the one I saw first, the gentleman with black hair and the glasses there. Hello. Uh, I would like to know about Silt Striders, please. Are they, uh, are they in the game or are they something? We have them, yes. Can you Who? Travel Silt Striders. Yes. So they are a means to fast travel within Morrowind. We have the we'll have the Wayshrine system and a Silt Striders transportation system. Yeah. 
Correct. There's one just behind you. Yeah, would there be dedication? Uh, in a limited fashion, <laughs> limited fashion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, limited. <laughs> that's called managing expectations. <laughs> Did uh, I mention it was limited? <laughs> so it's unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Uh, there was a question. There's a lady in the middle somewhere. Maybe. Oh yes. Um, will the moral tongue be a new guild like the warrior's guild or undaunted? It, it is not, yeah, you can't join them because in, uh, so the Morag Tong as a group uh, do not accept outsiders at all. They don't accept uh, really most Dunmer. Um, they're very, very insular, so it wouldn't make much sense for the player to be able to join them unless they were Dunmer, and then it was so. We, we didn't want to do that, so instead uh, you're helping the Morag Tong in, in, in this. So you're going to find out because you're helping Naryu. Um, so you'll you'll learn more about the Morag Tong, and you'll help them, but you're not going to actually join them. If I can channel your law master, I think he would say that's what the Dark Brotherhood yeah. is for. Right. Yeah. That's good. They they do exist to kill. Both organizations exist to assassinate people, but the Morag Tong is a little different. They they don't kill just anyone, and it's uh, yeah. But but they're cool. Yeah. Do you have any more questions? We got. Two, three minutes, a couple of minutes. Uh, we've got time for one more. This chap here. Do you need uh, more weight for the DLCs moving forward? Or is no, it no. Okay. Each chapter will be a separate unit. And will you, so you, you won't get the previous DLC. You'll buy Morrowind and then subscribe to ESO Plus yeah. or, or buy them in the Crown Store. Right. You don't get everything up to. And this when point the next chapter it. comes out, you won't have to have had Morrowind. You can okay. you can just buy the, the new chapter. Yeah. Great, cool. So we're going here. Yeah. Uh, so we saw in the videos that you've added uh, like pretty much most of the creatures from uh, Morrowind into the game. Are you except like the giant sentry we saw in uh, both the trailer and all that? Uh, are you adding more creatures that maybe become extinct in uh, the other whole game? Yeah, I, I think most of the uh, the ones that you saw in the video are the, are the ones that we have. Um, we have a variant of the cliff uh, uh, racer called the Cliff Strider. Yeah. So that was the one that would look like a raptor that was eating the... Um, we have the hunger, which is the one that was uh, feeding on the dead body, uh, which are gross. They're great. Uh, <laughs> we have Fletcher flies, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, so it's all things that you would be familiar with. But remember, we also have two zones of more wind in the base game that have... <clears throat> Uh, Guar, mm -hmm. matches, Kagudi, you know, and those will still be there, of course. So you'll be very familiar with them. Yeah, it was just if you added any new ones. Like, uh, <clears throat> there's some I'm new. There's some new Dweamer constructs. Yeah. Well, sort of. They're they're more soft to silk constructs. Um, fabricants is what we call them. So we've got those, um, but we don't like we don't have a ton of ghosts. <coughs> You know, Morrowind was full of ghosts because the ghost fence was up and all the craziness happened. In our timeline, the ghost fence hasn't actually been erected. And so, um, like Matt said, the, <coughs> the volcano hasn't really erupted that much. So uh, most of the, the ash lands are a little bit more contained now. Um, in places like Balmora, which, you know, was basically bone dry and, and whatnot and arid, is now actually really lush because that's the way it was before you know, the volcano took over, so... And I guess we're not going to see, uh, what's his name, Yagram, the, uh, the, Yagram, the Dwemer. The Dwemer, no. No. He's not there. Boo. Never mind. <laughs> uh, I think we're almost out of time. I can take one more, if anyone's got one really quick question they want to throw out. We have one here. Yes, um, about the, the buff trackers you guys shown in the trailer, um, is that something which you only plan for PvP, or is it something we can expect in PvP? It, it does both. So you can you there will be an option when it goes live. There will be an option that you can just turn it on, on or off, and then you can also go in and choose uh, if you want all of the long term buffs. Like if you only want it to show short term, you can do that. If it's just long term, like you can customize a little bit. Great. Uh, we're about out of time now, but I just wanted to give you guys each just one opportunity to say if everyone here forgets literally everything that we've said before this sentence and back, what's the one lasting thought you want them to take away about Morrowind? Matt? Uh, this is the best time to play this game. We have a ton of people playing it right now. 
We have a new product for people that haven't played to get in. So if anyone has friends that haven't played yet that you're trying to talk them into joining you, uh, because of one Tamriel, they can actually play with you now and with more when there's new content that you can play together as a warden in Battlegrounds. <laughs> <laughs> what he said. I, I was going to say Battlegrounds, but he said it better. So. <laughs> I imagine Brian was going to say Battlegrounds. I was going to say just walk around and have fun. Yeah. <laughs> just literally just have fun. Yeah. That's what the game is built for, having fun. Great. Perfect. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. So Matt, Rich, okay. Brian, thanks guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited now to be joined by Brian Wheeler, who is the <laughs> PvP lead designer oh, on fancy title. Elder Scrolls Online. So we've heard a lot from the stage interview. I've got a bunch of follow-up questions here that we're going to go a little deeper on. Okay. Uh, let's start, though. Um, sort of for hardcore Elder Scrolls fans, Morrowind obviously is the one that people have really formed some of the strongest emotional connections to. Um, so give us a reminder of how this is being approached to make sure they're not disappointed. It's, it's sort of the same vein of where we've built the game as a whole, where we're not trying to offend anybody with ESO lore. Um, the first thing we do is obviously go back and play Test 3. So you know what you're playing. The next step is digging into each of those... Like, you know, there's lore books all over the place. We have Lawrence, who knows what they are, but any content developer can then go into TS3, hop around, look at the lore books, and go, okay, what do I need to keep intact? What, what will Lawrence let me say or not say? Uh, plus, there's the height map, so it's the same exact gameplay space. It's just obviously scaled differently for our game. And we kind of went through the same thing with, with Cyrodiil, with the, the area that I had to make, where we look at the height map, scaled it, adjusted it, but also you look at things like Balmora, Vivek City, like they're sort of the same, but they're just rolled back. So you see parts of the city getting built. Uh, you see Balmora is not necessarily like Woodward said, desert land. The same thing existed in Coral and Chaden Hall. Like it's the same that you're familiar with, but it's a little bit different. And that's kind of it's it's cool and it's familiar, but it's also a new take on it. I think if the general theme is that the same kind of care and attention to detail went into this as went into the as went into S Imperial City, right. then I think in general people are going to be not what's the opposite of disappointed, appointed, pleased. You know, <laughs> they're going to be happy in the fact of oh okay, I, this is the districts, this is the area. Like it, same thing goes for I keep saying Vivek City because every time I walk in there, I like that that architecture is burned in my brain. But you see like where they're building the other portions of the city it's really cool to see that and and how long has this chapter been in, in development sort of from conceptual stages onwards god i don't know <laughs> I, I don't know when the official chats started on it but i know that in terms of battlegrounds we've started i think at least a year year and a half ago um, i remember on eso live saying that uh, we're working on battlegrounds and dueling and when dueling came out they were like all right well where are the battlegrounds and well, here they are <laughs> I see. So it's and how does that compare to say the the DLC in terms of sort of rough times and development re requirements? Those, they're always rolling in terms of how the development process goes. Uh, they're usually worked on several months in advance to them actually getting released, and they're usually worked on. God, I want to say anywhere between four months to to eight months, depending upon how big each DLC is. And could you give us a sense of scale in terms of like how many people work on these? And, and how does it compare for something like this, which obviously is very big, incorporates huge numbers of changes and new game types, to, say, you know, Dark Brotherhood or Thieves Guild? The whole studio is working on this one. Whereas, let's say, Dark Brotherhood, uh, specifically that may be one to four teams. I can't give you specific numbers. But in, in the regard of the entire studio is working on Morrowind, but let's say Dark Brotherhood, not necessarily the entire studio, because they're still working on other things to keep ahead of the DLC progress. And, um, you know, other than making sure, obviously, the zone um, looks like it did in Test 3, what would you say is uh, the biggest or one of the biggest challenges involved in making this chapter compared to maybe some of the others? I think the, the big challenge for this one is how big it is. Uh, besides Cyrodiil... This is a huge, a huge, huge zone. It's the biggest zone we've done PvE-wise to date. So that's probably the biggest challenge. And integrating 
other systems into this one into i mean a new a new continent is a system so to speak but uh battlegrounds is a whole new system that is not just introduced with morrowind it's going to work across the entire game and we're going to keep adding on to battlegrounds as we go so it's not just the fact that Vardenfell, the landmass is huge, but we're introducing another huge system along with it that is going to be global. So it's pretty awesome in the fact that we're able to, as a studio, get get this made and have it all meshed together in a in a great package. I'm going to swap hands here because okay. I realize doing it this way around is probably a lot more efficient. Like cross-handed. Cross-handed, yeah. yeah. Um, so. Can you give us a bit more detail uh, then on some of these new game modes for, for Battlegrounds and, and maybe walk us through how these three types of uh, play styles will work in as much excruciating detail as, as, possible. as, you, pos- as oh, you possibly boy. can? Um, we'll start with the simplest, Team Deathmatch. Uh, it's just like any other Team Deathmatch game out there. There's your four versus that four versus those four. And Killing Blow gives you the credit for the score. I know that could be a bit contentious because one team could be working on another team's healer. They're working them down and then my team comes in and snipes the kill. But that's team deathmatch. That's how it functions across the board from uh, Quake to Doom. The person that gets the kill gets the kill point. So we're following suit with that as well. Uh, The game modes are going to be pretty quick. I'll go into the other two game modes in a second, but some broad base stuff. Uh, They will last at most 15 minutes. And usually when a team is like very focused on winning and playing the game to to win they maybe go about seven eight minutes uh at at worst in terms of getting to the score win condition um 10 minutes at worst but going back to the game modes uh there's uh, capture the flag it's pretty simple get keep your flag safe go get the enemy's flags we're still working out how we're going to do the capture reset so to speak because there's three flags it's not two flags there's if my team has another team's flag en route and I had another team's flag just picked up and started to be moved towards my guys, I don't want to penalize my team by saying we reset all flags when one of those flags is captured because I'm screwing myself out of points. So we're still discussing whether it's going to be full reset on single flag capture or reset after a period of time because you want to give the teams an opportunity that are doing well to score two flag captures versus just one. Uh, that being said, when flags like drop in the world, if a uh, if an enemy picks it up, they actually pick it up, much like an Elder Scroll mm. in Cyrodiil. If an ally clicks the flag, it returns home. So that's a little bit different than than what happens out uh, with with let's say murder ball, for example. Like that's a game mode that we're not launching at first, but in that one, like it'll reset back to its home location and anybody can click it. So there's some descriptions of game modes there that they're similar, but they're a little bit different. And we'll go into, I think, a, a more familiar one that everybody's used to, which is uh, the, the four-point capture location. They, those are captured much like Imperial City flags or a farm flag. There's no guards <laughs> on these, though. So that's good. But we had to make the speed of these things go very quickly because in some of our testing, if a flag takes, let's say... Uh, 10 seconds to go from owned to neutral and then another 10 seconds to go to captured that kind of went against that feeling of frantic pace that let's say deathmatch or ctf offers so we need to make sure that when you capture a flag in domination they go it's a very quick capture Uh, we're not exactly sure how fast the timing is going to be just yet but we know we want like a full flip for a solo player to probably take around 10 seconds because we don't want you standing there going, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. <laughs> Granted, there is a little bit of benefit to that, to having you assaulting a flag and then exposing yourself as assaulting a flag. But we don't want it to last really long like it does out in Cyrodiil, mm. because it's not... Like the resources. It's not a war. Yeah, this is a quick match. It's supposed to meant, it, It's meant to be very quick, meant to be very fun and fast-paced. So the flag capture also has to be very fast-paced. That's as much detail as I think I can give. They... Uh, all of them use a respawn timer, much like Imperial City. Um, right now, I think we have that set to 20 seconds at max. Obviously, one second if you're lucky. Um, 
and you don't earn alliance points or XP as you play. You earn it only in the end. Well, I've got a whole bunch of questions that relate to AP right. in a <laughs> in a few in a few moments. So okay. hold hold that I'll thought. Hold those, yeah. um, but in terms of um, you know the general game play in these modes. You mentioned guards, which aren't there. Right. I did notice that there was lava in one of the uh -huh. uh, presentations earlier. So there are environmental obstacles. Are there anything like, are there any monsters? Are there any creatures that are spawning to get in your way? Uh, none in the game modes that we're initially proposing. We may do that later on in some other game modes, but the general rule for these is... Uh, Obviously, player versus player oriented only in three teams, but also like schoolyard games. Things that when you see it, you recognize it right away. You know, CTF, it's universal. It's CTF. Go get their flag, bring it home. Deathmatch is deathmatch. Domination or, or territories is another way that people call it. It's, it's universal. You hop in, you see the flags on the map, you go, okay, I need to go get that. We don't want to get too complex. Uh, we don't want to have things where you need to have a tutorial to learn it because that's what Cyrodiil is the war and we had to teach people how a war functions whereas a battleground it's you have 15 minutes at worst to play so there's no time to waste in trying to figure out how to play the game so the, I'll jump ahead into one of my that was going to be a later question then which is how players actually find the battlegrounds in the first place and whether mm -hmm. you know is there going to be some sort of small quest or hand holding system that introduces right. them to the concept or is it just you have to know about it and just select there and fast travel yeah there's there's going to be an on ramp quest there'll be posts n nailed across various places in Morrowind uh, as well as I think capital cities back in the mainland uh, that will on ramp you to uh, the, one of the Battleground Master locations outside of Vivek City, and you'll talk to an NPC there. He'll kind of tell you, hey, this is how Battlegrounds function. And then to hop into it, you just hit uh, P for party activities, and there'll be a new listing there for Battlegrounds, and you queue in. So we learned earlier that AP will be earned rather than uh, another new currency. And I was curious on a couple of points there. One, whether you considered adding a new currency or form of alternative reward there. Um, in fact, let's just go with that one to begin with. Did you right. consider another currency? Right, One was considered, but we wanted to stick with the player versus player stuff outside of Imperial City. Focuses on alliance points as a whole. Uh, there was a discussion at one point of the lore slash why are you learn earning alliance points in a battleground that's that fueled this question to be honest right. yeah and and the reason that we're still allowing is because it's it, alliance points fuel the assault and support lines so we still needed to let that be the case because you're doing a pvp fight so that's why we we're like okay we need to award alliance points because that progresses our pvp skill lines and you are pvping in here that was the main reason why we just went mm, nope alliance points will work so a follow-on question to that then is i was curious about whether people could technically become an accidental emperor if they earned the most ap to their yeah. character and just happened to you know their their alliance happened to you know capture the imperial city right. like could that technically happen now the alliance points in there are not going to go towards leaderboards of serial leaderboards they'll go towards uh, progressing your character and then the other leaderboards which I'm guessing you're going to ask about real soon is uh, earned another way how are the other leaderboards <laughs> going to work yeah uh, so so every match you're going to earn a, a medal based on activities you do you were you earn several medals actually um, the best example I can give you is in team deathmatch you'll earn points for getting let's say a 5k crit or a 10k crit damage you will also earn points for healing for 5k or 10k so there's a real benefit to you really understanding your class your build yes. and and you know almost perfecting it in order to score those bonuses specifically in battlegrounds mm -hmm. and to that end those medals that you would earn in team deathmatch you don't earn in ctf or you don't earn those in domination matches because we want the medals to reflect the game mode so in ctf you'll get points or medals for healing a flag carrier for being a flag carrier for killing a flag carrier for returning a flag you'll get medals for that and those medals are what go to the various leaderboards and so there's three leaderboards one's team deathmatch one is mobile flag games one static flag games and it's pretty broad broad based there in terms of static and mobile because when we add new game modes, the medals earned from those game modes will go to those same three leaderboards one way or another. 
And at, at the moment, at the end of the campaigns in Cyrodiil, there's sort of a bonus reward given out for if you've been part of a campaign that's done particularly well, your sort of your contribution is rewarded. Is this similar for, you know, maintaining a certain position for a certain period of time within Battlegrounds? Uh, I know that the Battlegrounds are going to run on a, uh, the leaderboards for Battlegrounds are going to be a week to week basis. So they're seven days. I don't think there's going to be a loyalty type thing because you just continue to play whatever battleground you want. But there will be leaderboard rewards on a weekly basis, and we're still nailing down what the threshold for that will be. Uh, in the presentation earlier, it was noted that AP is going to be awarded sort of in one lump sum at the end of the fight rather than uh, incrementally per kill as it is in Cyrodiil. Um, and as somebody who wants the most gold, the most AP, the most Telvar, mm-hmm. the most experience, etc., etc., et I'm curious, how much AP can I make from Battlegrounds? What, what's an average fight? Well, we're still, we're still nailing that down, but that being said, we know what the AP maximum and average and minimum are per hour in Cyrodiil. So you're, we're going to be using those numbers to determine how, how the Battleground AP reward scales. We haven't, again, we haven't nailed that down yet, but we have those numbers to look at. And then we can say, okay, well, we know, let's say, the average user gets 20K AP per hour. Let's say that's the average. Is that, that, is that the average? There's, it's, it's close. But <laughs> with the recent changes to uh, the, the resources and the keeps, it's, it's gone up. It used to be lower. But we're watching it and waiting to see where it kind of like levels out. My uh, benchmark at the moment is earning 200000 a day. That's pretty good. How many hours do you play a day? Uh, if that was, if I was earning two hundred thousand, I would imagine that was probably from you know like five p.m. till eleven p.m. So about six hours. Six hours at peak time. Yeah, so that's pretty good. That's that's about a slightly above average, I'd say. So that's good. You're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> but lo- looking at that number, we're going to be going. What's the value that battlegrounds give? Because we are well aware that there could be an arms race at hand here. We know that there's the gameplay mode that people like. Like Some people just like a quick match to go in and play. Other people love warfare and serial fights and uh, using siege and castle sieges. So we don't think that there's going to be any shortage of players in serial over the long term. We know when Morrowind comes out, there's going to be a ton of people playing Battlegrounds. But we're going to be looking at the AP gains and XP gains and making sure that the, they are roughly on par with each other. We don't want to have one be like, well, this is the only way to get AP, so do that. So one last one on just on AP, because I can't not ask you, is, uh, you know, I've been playing this game for three years now. I'm well over halfway to becoming a Grand Overlord. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'm curious if any of those thresholds are going to be changed to make that easier for long-time players. Uh, the, The thresholds, we would not be changing that, but we are looking at speeding up AP gains. That's kind of like the first step with that was done with the resources and the keeps recently where we cranked up the amount of AP you get we'll be watching that obviously we know that we know the behavior that that creates and has created and has created in other games um, but we're we're trying to speed people along a little bit more that's why also with all the daily quests in Cyrodiil you now also get 250 AP and that's why we also bumped up the amount of AP you get per scout and keep capture as well um, let's talk a little bit briefly about uh, about Cyrodiil more. I just wanted to sort of check that you know you're happy with that and it's all healthy. I've noticed recently there've been a few changes. Um, I think at least on the EU side we lost a couple of the campaigns, um, and I was just curious what's motivating those changes and how your senses of that uh, you know that whole how gameplay yeah how it's working. The well specifically on the fact of closing some campaigns in Europe, uh, those campaigns were very low population. I know that people would argue that uh, Spell... Spellbreaker. Spell Spellbreaker Spell Spell was starting to make a comeback, and it's true, it was starting to make a comeback, but there was enough room to fold the population of Spellbreaker uh, into, let's say, Hatteras or Azura or True Flame. Uh, what was the other one that got closed? Ebony Blade? Ebony Blade that there was plenty enough room for everybody to fit and looking at the population ever since those closures occurred it, it's fine the population looks good um, we hope that that makes a more competitive environment especially in Hatteras and Azura Star because those campaigns were not filled to the brim so having more players being able to funnel into there will hopefully make it a more competitive environment now that being said 
everybody always asks the follow-up of, well, what about performance when the case of folding more people into those? And we're also watching that. We have seen performance gains or better performance since the last patch. I have definitely seen it's performed a lot better over the last three months. Right, and, and that it's a thing that, you know, it's a process. We're continually knocking off things that we see that are hitting the server harder and harder that we go, okay, well, let's, let's not have that hit the server as hard. And in doing, in doing that, it's basically uh, peeling back layers of an onion bit by bit by bit till we go, okay, we're at our, we're at our good point, but we're not there yet. We, we know that there are still some things we can do on the server to fix things. There's, um, there's still stuff on the client we need to do because like you said earlier, sometimes when you're playing and your frames go to 10 FPS, and you're running on, let's say, high or ultra, people react and say, well, my frames are crap. And we're trying to fix that as well. Um, we did a recent change for this past update where server-side specifically, we took some uh, some abilities and kind of stored them in, let's say, temporary memory at all times for the server to continually reference as opposed to being called each individual time. So that saved some some frames on the server. Uh, there's some there's some other crazy mojo that our guys did that has adjusted how much the server has to calculate on a uh, detection cell by detection cell basis, and that has seemed to to help out a lot. But we know, we know there's still more work to do. It's certainly improved, and you can tell in a couple of areas. I mean, a the Alessia bridge fights that have you know a hundred plus people often you know knocking the hell out of each other there like yeah. those perform kind of fine now at least on for, for me and on EU and then obviously you know taking ash uh as mm-hmm. the final keep from someone and you know you have yeah, all yeah, three alliances yeah. exactly yeah. um but again i mean that used to, there was one point where it was really bad and now it's really quite good yeah. uh, and totally playable we're, so we're still put, we want to get away from just playable though we want to make it good like we, i would say it's good honestly we, i would, based on this week alone i would say it's good we well we know that we can do better because we look at azura star and we look at blackwater blade and on on campaigns and scenarios where their population is closer to True Flame, which is obviously the most populated one in, in PCs, both NA and EU. Um, we know that there is performance we can squeak out of standard quote-unquote campaigns. Um, we're still trying to nail down exactly what that's going to be, but we know that there's more work to do. And on a technical level, are there any other sort of major updates going in or, or being planned for um, for the Morrowind chapter you know we've seen things in the past you know even at, just after launch there was a new lighting system you know later right. on we saw better lip syncing and later that came to Mac and in Cyrodiil we saw doors being removed from towers which was a, an interesting that change that was a fun one that, the doors from the towers was highly contentious um, I prefer it to be honest that, I like it that change was one where for the longest time, people will just go inside a tower and use the door as the barrier, as opposed to using their player abilities. And after after watching that behavior for a while, Rich and I had a very lengthy discussions about using the door mechanically or using it as an exploit. And when you say exploit, it's a dirty word. But it's the scenario of some people, when they click that door, they don't load in right away. They have like a four or five second delay, and when they load in, they're dead. Mm -hmm. And that is not a good experience we want to have players have. And whether you knew that as the person dooring or not, you didn't know that they were not loading in for four or five seconds. And in that scenario, we wanted to clear, clear the door away, make it so that you saw the person run in. So it was an equal opportunity for both of you to fight, as opposed to... Well, I hope my my computer doesn't lag when I do this. So uh, that was a pretty contentious change. But like you said, we think in the long run it's worked out for the better because it has changed players' strategies and they've actually started to use the bottlenecks that the tower was meant to provide. You know, there's the one when you go up the first stairwell, Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a bottleneck on that ledge, then there's the two when you go up, and then there's the one on the roof. And we've seen all those stages of a tower defense or a tower assault work out now and those didn't exist before no it's actually made it a little bit like what makes the bridge 
fight so compelling is that there's a there's a funnel there's stages and funnels and bottlenecks yes exactly and it's 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 satisfying to play on both sides it's it's satisfying to to be the attacker in those mm-hmm. situations and it's equally satisfying to defend it as long as you can and um so I think that's one of the reasons why I like that that change. Um, but 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 aside from that, you know, we going back to the, those technical changes. There've been a few of these things that have made quite a notable difference to the game. You know, the lighting, the lip sync, right. and so forth. Is there anything like that that's you know it's it's not going to be on page one of the press release, but is is being brought in? I mean, I know that there's some performance things we're looking to add, but I don't know specifically what would be going into fourteen or fourteen Morrowind. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always base game changes that we're doing, whether it be class balance or whether it be uh, systems that help just the overall health of the game. Um, I don't know if there are any systems much like what you referenced going into Morrowind, but there definitely will be base game adjustments, like for balance as well as just for uh, quality of life additions that are just small things, like this item now does X. Mm-hmm. Uh, a final question then, just on on battlegrounds. Um, compared to Cyrodiil, we have you know, or rather in Cyrodiil, we have a campaign that has champion points. We have a campaign that is champion point free, depending on playstyle. Is there any are there any changes like that in plan in planned for battlegrounds? And also more broadly, how does the champion system factor into battlegrounds? Right. Uh, we know that one Q absolutely will be a ten to forty nine, much like Blackwater Blade, no CP enabled. Uh, the other two queues are in discussion of 10 to 50 with CP or 10 to 50 without CP because we've seen the popularity of Azura Star. That is definitely a game mode that is getting more and more uh, attention from players, but also uh, more, let's say, not it's not a min-max campaign, but more of a you just need to pay attention to what the hell is going on campaign. Because you don't have as much resources that you do with champion points. You don't have uh, the regen. So builds are very important in that campaign. And we're seeing more and more people gravitate towards that. So the other cues for, for, for Battlegrounds will either be 10 to 50 CP enabled or 10 to 50 no CP enabled. We may offer both as well as the 10 to 49. Um, but the, the main reason we have a 10 to 50 is that if I've been playing the game for a while and you just started, we can still play together. Or I gotta re-roll a new character and get it to ten real quick. <laughs> so those those are the three cues that are in discussion. We know that Azura Star is getting more and more popular, which may mean more and more weight towards a, a non-CP battleground system. But we're we're still debating that one heavily <laughs> internally. Uh, one question that I know uh, my beloved host, the Jealous, wanted uh, me to ask is. Whether you've got any thoughts on having two-handed items like you know great swords and destruction staffs and, and bows and things uh, count as two for the That's set bonuses, um, because at the moment there's a bit of a discrepancy with the dual wield. Yeah. You know, I dual wield and I get an extra set piece, whereas someone who with a two-handed or my other bar, I miss out on that extra item. Yeah, we have been discussing expressly that. I don't know exactly where we're going with it because that's more of the combat team's baby, like handling whether itemization whether you get a five-piece, two-piece bonus from it or not uh, is being discussed, and I don't know where we're going with that one just yet. I, As a player, I agree. Like It would be great, but as, a, as the person developing it, uh, I do not know where we stand on that one. Uh, final, final question then. What haven't we talked about that we really should have talked about in this interview? I would say the biggest thing, kind of like what I said on stage, was have fun playing ESO. That's a big a big thing that kind of gets missed out on. Uh, a lot of people play the game to min-max to 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 be the the best at X, but you kind of lose out a bit on the fact that you're just supposed to have fun. You're just supposed to run around, explore the universe, have a good time, have some real fun playing a game that is meant to be played for fun. Like games are meant to be enjoyed whether you're playing by yourself or whether you're playing with friends. And we've started to see more of that come along. We've started to see more people just enjoying themselves and smiling and playing. Because for a while, it was a lot of very serious faces. Like, we need to be the best. I need to get Emperorship now, and this is how I'm going to push for it. But we think that seeing more people having fun and just playing is starting to catch on and sort of be infectious. Where you just see people 
dancing at the on at the uh, the undaunted enclave, or just people like throwing spears in the sky like crazy because they're doing a, a rave party. It's just it's just interesting to watch people have fun again, and uh, I think every time we have a patch, especially with like when when ta- when Tamriel came out. Everybody was in gold rush territory. Like, get the sets, sell them on the auction houses as much as possible. It's happening a little bit now with the Master Rit stuff as well. Right. And I think when that stuff dies down, people then start to go, okay, yeah, I'm here to have fun again. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun to watch the, the process of people finding fun and just having fun in ESO. And that's, that's, that's an important aspect that I think is starting to catch on in Morrowind, I think, with Battlegrounds with how fast you can just hop in and play, will add to that just exponentially. Amazing. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. And, you know, I should say, of course, on behalf of all of our listeners to Tales of Tamriel, thank you for making a game that we've spent the last three years loving and having a podcast all about and, and getting to discuss and, and play together. So uh, we're very excited and, and hope that the, the launch goes well and we get to do this all again in a year's time for, you know, Elder Scrolls Online Oblivion or Skyrim or... Elder Scrolls new stuff. Exactly. New stuff, in quotes, yes. Brian Wheeler, thank you so much. Sure, thank you all for playing and uh, letting us have a fun job. A serpent lights the ancient sky A bread of tainted stars Evil stirs and in its wake The souls of mortals sway So the beauty of dawn.